Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, Shakespeare from the Islamic University of Gaza. Uh, today we continue discussing uh, <clears throat> Othello. Last time we finished Othello's uh, Act One, Scene One. Uh, today we're going uh, to talk uh, about uh, scenes two and and three and raise uh, some issues uh, for discussion. Uh, but I'll go a little bit back for uh, some issues we discussed in uh, Act One, Scene One, so we can build upon. Remember, uh, like Hamlet, this uh, this uh, Scene One. Uh, all the opening of this play was very dramatic, very suspenseful. We didn't have the main character promised to us. Okay, uh, there was no Othello. It started at night. There were people planning and scheming and plotting. There were people uh, uh, disturbing the peace and the sleep of other of other people everybody was talking about uh, uh, Othello but nobody was using uh, Othello's name he was described uh, as thick lips as uh, using animalistic uh, imagery as a thief as promiscuous as lusty as a black ram uh, we describe this in drama as we call we call this framing. Framing is when one character presents another character to us. We said it happened again in Hamlet, and it's happening here. Here it happens everywhere. Some members of the audience can be tempted to take this for granted, to dislike or hate this framed character because of what people are saying about him. But we said you have to be careful because this could be far from the truth. But sometimes the whole play is built, built up on this. Remember how Horatio framed uh, Fortinbras and then Hamlet framed him in a different way. And then we had him on the stage in the last, in the closing scene of the play. Now, there's no, there's no Othello. We hear of him. We don't see him. He's not on the stage. He's presented to us in these negative images. But what is interesting about these negative images these negative frames is that they are heavily loaded with racism, with racial discrimination, with white supremacy. And therefore we said, it's wrong to dismiss racism and racial differences from, from a fellow. It's not only wrong, it's naive and itself is racist. Okay? So trying to dismiss racism is racism here because you say there's nothing here to see. Nobody is racist. That's okay, that's normal. We don't dislike him because he is black or Muslim or Chinese or Asian. But look at this, thick lips, black ram, black, yeah, and it tastes asmar. Describe as the more, the more, every time here and there. Describe as lusty, as exotic, using all these animalistic and bestial images to describe him tells us that this is a play about racism. Dismissing racism here is like dismissing anti-Semitism from the Merchant of Venice, which is wrong. So this scene, in a way, again, we have Othello, thank God, finally, with Iago, who declared that he hates the Moor, that he had a plan to destroy him because he didn't promote him. The only reason he gave us that he didn't get the deserved promotion. And look at what Iago is saying here. Though in the trade of war, I have sl slain men. Again, boasting about his ability in war and in battles. Everybody wants to be a smatcher. I've slain men. Yet I do hold it very stuff of the conscience to do no contrived murder. I lack antiquity sometimes to do some service. Nine or 10 times I had thought to have yet him here under the rib. I wanted to stab him under the rib, just directly in, in the heart. Him, who's him? The way he was hemming, you know, Othello in scene one, he's now hemming another one. 
he's again inciting Othello the way he was inciting Rodrigo and the way he was along with Rodrigo inciting Barbancho against Othello. So the him here could be a reference, we're not sure actually whether he's referring to Rodrigo or Barbancho. So he's telling Othello, they're assaulting you, they're attacking you, be careful myself. And again, look at the traumatic iron here, the traumatization, the intensity we experience as audience. Just now, very now. Iago was promising us that he hates Othello, that he wants to destroy Othello. And now he's pretending like to be his best friend. He's advising him, look, be careful my, myself. And again, he continues uh, warning him against what's going uh, to ha happen. Othello replies briefly at the beginning. Uh, he says something, uh, you know, I like what uh, major characters, that's, uh, remember Hamlet saying, uh, uh, a little more than kin and less than kind. Here he says, it is better as it is. Don't worry about me, in a way. Don't worry about me. But then he speaks here, casually, informally, and I want you to look at this text, this extract, and to tell me what you notice about this man's character. Yeah, I'll give you one minute. So if you read this, that's page 30 something, 38, lines 17, 18, and etc. So what do you notice? Unmute or type? What words do you notice? What, if, if you've uh, come face to face with this person saying this, what idea is this talk going to give about him? Simple language, Poss possible, yeah. Let him do his part. The I, who's, okay, Khalid, thank you. So Ahmed Dadr says, uh, the Dadrs are controlling that class today, which is, uh, which is good. Ahmed Dada says, simple language, more or less it's simple language. Khalid Dada says, the I, how many eyes do we have? I have, I know, I shall, I fetch, I have, I love, I have again, and I would. Ooh, and then there is my, how many mys? One, my, two mys, three mys. What does that tell about this person? And Ahmed Yassin agrees that there are a lot of eyes. Not eyes, because eyes are also necessary here, but eyes, the personal pronoun. What did Diago say about him exactly in scene one? He's, he used one particular word. Uh, Khaled, when you, when you talk, Khaled, when you, when you answer a question and you say, it seems true what Tiago said about him in scene one, this means nothing to me, okay? You need to tell me what, what exactly uh, Iago said about what exactly you're focusing on. He said he is arrogant, thank you. He said he's proud, he said he's bombastic. He likes not only to talk, he likes to talk in this eloquent, articulate way. But look at him here. If you want to describe him in egocentric, thank you, uh, Abdullah, for using this word. Thank you, Sarah, proud of himself, exactly. What other words? So he's, he's bombastic, he's pedantic, he's uh, self-centered, he's egocentric. What else? Do you think he's confident? Do you think he is, you know, these words? How would you describe Othello? That's a huge issue here, Shayma. Whether does he really know himself? We'll ask this question as we go on. Does he really know? Him? Not necessarily. People who say, "I, I, 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 I did this, I did that," usually are egocentric, narcissistic sometimes, but not necessarily people who know themselves. He's proud of him. He loves himself. But I love how he confesses that that he, I love. Gentle Desdemona, I love her. This is why I married her. This is why, why, eloped, why we eloped. He seems confident. He seems, he says, I will out-tongue his complaints. Again, he's referring to her father. Out-tongue, I'll beat him in, in words, in language, in the way I speak. I am bombastic, I am. He's boasting of his honor, true. 
So I counted some of these uh, uh, later on here. I'll come to this here. He's confident, he's calm, he's reasonable. He's argumentative, he's talkative. Khalid, thank you. Is he naive though? Because he's so confident and don't worry about me. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to out-tongue him, to outperform him. I am more argumentative than he is. He's pro is he dull though? For a, for a fighter, is he dull? We'll see. He's brave also, he doesn't care. He's being threatened. But seemingly he is self-serving because later on we'll see here that there was a war impending. The Turks, the Ottoman, the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire was attacking Cyprus, uh, planning to attack Cyprus. And as a leader in the army, as a commander, Othello, instead of protecting, defending, he's busy getting married with personal issues rather than defending his country. So he could be self self but he's also a passionate person. He's expressing his love to this demona. The thing here is that he doesn't see himself as an outsider. Remember scene one, treated him, othered him, you know, othered him. He's different in color, in shape, in mentality, in culture, background, in origin, in everything. He's a man who uses magic, unlike Christians. But he doesn't see himself. So as Shema said, he knows himself. This shows that he doesn't know himself. He thinks he's an insider. He belongs in, uh, in Venice, but he doesn't. Note, uh, he's not, again, definitely, uh, I could disagree with Khalid, who said he is exactly like what Iago introduced him to us. In part, Iago was correct. But he's not the base animalistic thief. When he is told that her, he, uh, what's her name? Desdemona's father is planning, you know, to sever this bond, destroy this marriage. He doesn't say, okay, I'm holding my gun. I'm holding my, my sword. I'm going to fight back. Don't worry. If he does anything, I'm going to kill him. He's not base, Mishwadiya. He's not animalistic. He's not a thief. So probably in part, Iago was quite true, but not, not totally. And in the next scene here, uh, look at this interesting thing. Othello says, not I, again, this probably summarizes what I just said again and again. Shakespeare repeats what he wants us to understand. Not I, I must be found, my parts, my title, and my perfect soul. The repetition of the I, 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 he's proud of himself. He's very proud. Shall manifest me rightly. He's confident that what he did, what the, the service he has been doing to Venice is going to help him. My, my part, my title, my perfect soul. I'm a good man. Shall manifest me rightly. Shall serve me. People are going to support me because I'm a good man. I have done a lot to serve this country. It, it is there. And then look at uh, somewhere a page. Uh, one of the pages where Iago swears by Janus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this name correctly. In, in the book here, page 39, it says, this is the God known for having two faces. <laughs> it says here, where's that? The two-faced God of the Romans. The two-faced, and nobody in the whole world has two faces like like Iago. Look at Shakespeare, what he's throwing, what evidence. And again, some people will say, but most of the people, most of the masses wouldn't understand this, wouldn't pick on these because they don't, they don't have Latin or Greek uh, education. I said probably, I mentioned this in passing before, Shakespeare wants to show that he has this knowledge, to show off a little bit. But he also gives these as some more people who are educated. How the globe itself, the structure, how the poor people were near the stage and the rich people were up distant. So I'm sure many, many, many rich people didn't like the fact that there were other poor people who would be making jokes and, you know, in new windows and um, practical jokes. They would be like, oh my God, why are we sitting here? So every time Shakespeare throws something they know, they can recognize, and the, the, the poor masses, they don't understand, they will feel superior again. So Shakespeare's like, don't worry, you are still superior. Those people are not going to recognize this two-faced God, but those of you 
the high class, the elite, will understand this and will appreciate it. He wants to keep them. He wants to pull them into the place. And look at this interesting thing. Cassio, who was promoted, lieutenant, he, he, he is the only, the, probably the main person here. Othello doesn't know that a war is impending because he was too busy getting married and running away with a, uh, uh, someone half his age. And he doesn't know about Othello's personal life. And then look at, again, how demeaning, objectifying Iago to women is. Google what's going on? What, what's, what's going on, Cassio? Faith, he tonight has boarded a land Karak. A land Karak. A land Karak is a huge ship with a lot of properties and goods and possessions. If it prove lawful prize, he's made forever. He's getting rich. Yeah? And we got a kins. <laughs> he's getting I mean, look at how he's talking about this demona, but in these objectifying terms, he's it's his business, she's a bargain. And again, Cassio, I don't understand. He's married, but he's married to a rich woman. A woman that is going to make him rich forever and ever. Now, Babanchi, when he shows in scene two, he shouts again, down with him, thief! Yaskut al-haram al And they draw on both sides. <laughs> they draw, draw here, not draw like somebody, some, one of you drew, drew just now. Draw, Ibamana Ejem, Tashak Saif. On both sides. Othello's men and uh, Barbantio's men. Look at this, look at this. Sometimes, I remember when, with Hamlet, we said you could read Hamlet a hundred times, and every time you see things that you didn't notice before. Shakespeare keeps doing this in an amazing way. I think this is one way that makes Shakespeare really cool. When they attack, when Rodrigo is coming, remember Rodrigo was with Othello, with Iago, the first scene, and we understood that Iago is using him, using his money. He seems to be a little bit naive. When this opens, when they attack, Rodrigo, you, Rodrigo, come, sir, I am for you. He wanted to pretend that he will fight Rodrigo. Ta'al. <laughs> And look at this. This is one of the most famous lines ever said by Othello. Many people quote this. Some people think this is the first thing he ever said. And I wish it had been. So, keep your, keep up your bright swords for the, the dew will rust them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven words, monosyllabics. All Monosyllables, one syllable words. It's beautiful. Keep up your swords. Keep your swords. Don't throw them, for the dew will rust them. Because this could mean many things. What does he mean? Like nobody's going to use his swords, but look at how confident and you know composed he is. He could have just drew himself and killed most of them. Keep you up, or I'm not sure. Like, if is he threatening here, saying if you want to, uh, I don't know, if you want to fight, I can kill you, and your swords will remain here at night, and they will rust. Look into this more. What's beautiful? Keep up. Look how again the simple language, like Ahmed said just now. Keep up your bright swords, for the dew will rust them. And talks directly to Babanchio, his father-in-law, Hama. Good senor, you shall more command with years than with your weapons. Until you have the seniority, look at how respectful he is. You have the seniority, you are an old man. You can say anything will obey. You don't have to use your, your sword. You don't have to use weapons. What is it you want here? And again, we describe uh, uh, Othello as respectful, civilized, and refined, again, unlike, very unlike, the man framed in the opening scene as animalistic, as bestial, as uncivilized. He's understanding. He understands, he respects this man because probably he's his father-in-law, because this is the nature of Othello. And again, look at what Barbantio 
does here. First he said, the thief, and now, oh thou foul thief, where hast thou stored my daughter? The traction is stored my daughter. When the hashtag to store something. And again, objectifying that she was stolen. Remember in scene one? Damned as thou art, thou hast enchanted her. You used magic against her. For I'll refer me to all the things of sins. If she in chains of magic were not bound, I am sure she's now chained, but not physically chained. She's chained in chains of magic. You enchanted the Saharta. Impossible for somebody, for a white woman in Venice to agree to marry a black man. Despite the fact that he's a, a warrior, a great man, respectful, everybody likes him and respects him. Most people, not everybody. Whither a maid so tender, fair, and happy, so opposite to marriage that she shunned the wealthy curl darlings of our nation, she refused everybody. Our nation, look at this, our and us, the othering here, our and us, we and you, she and, he, and, and, and he. She refused the wealthy curl darlings of our nation. Would ever have it in care a general mock run from her garbage to his sooty bosom. You know sooty, soot, television is soot. Soot, what's soot? Is o o t is double o t anybody knows? Soot is scam. Soot scam. No, tavish is scam is like uh scam. عمر حاضر نقول لكم يا مسخان مش مسخان سخام when you when you make fire a very dark black material chimneys yes خالد the very dark issues here after the fire in the in the chimney on the walls this is called soot sooty bosom again referring to his blackness as being why he's against this marriage of such a thing as thou to fear not to delight, judge me the world if it is not gross in sense. I don't care what you say about me, that thou has practiced on her with foul charms. You have practiced magic. Again, while he's doing three things here, he's defending himself because this is very shameful to him. Oh, this man's daughter, this senator's daughter has eloped with a black man. He doesn't control, he doesn't have control over his house. Ah. So he's defending himself. I think he's defending himself more than he's defending his daughter or afraid for her. Number two, he is attacking Othello, othering and outsiding, dismissing him as somebody who doesn't belong to this nation because of his blackness, because of using magic. This society, we don't use magic. We do use other means. And at the same time, sadly, he's objectifying, he's presenting What's her name? This Demona, as naive, as somebody who cannot make up her mind, as stupid, as unintellectual. Khalid says, How unlike Polonius he is, I think how like Polonius he is in many ways. Abused her delicate youth with, with drugs or minerals. You must have, you know, dosed her, or what, what's the word? Spiked her drinks that weaken options. He presents his daughter as an object. He doesn't trust his daughter's judgment. He doesn't want his daughter to love somebody, this person. He wants to control her. He treats her as objects, Khaled. Probably this is partly why. So it says here, I'm quoting something from your uh, textbook. So that the use of sotibosom, the, emph the emphasis on Othello being an outsider rather than an insider, and the magic and the spells are usually associated with paganism, Bothanian, rather than Christians, because Othello, we know, has already converted to Christianity. The question is, does Barabantu care more about his reputation than his daughter? I think he does. And I'll go through this very quickly. This Dumona's marriage promises Barabantu a lifetime of shame. He fears being seen by his peers as a man unable to control his daughter and his home. 
who at the time would have been considered a legal position, his daughter. By explaining this demonic action, actions as being induced by sorcery, by magic, by spells, by poison, Barbantio attempts to explain the situation in the only way that makes sense for him. In his mind, no other reason exists that the daughter of an upstanding and prominent Venetian citizen and senator, a, fa a politician, would run off and secretly, secretly marry. Especially when the groom is a Moor. When the groom is a black man with a sooty bosom, thick lips, black ram. In this scene, Barbancho shows how little he understands this demona, preferring to construct and, elab uh, and elaborate and uh, 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 serious charges against Othello, something missing, rather than accept that his daughter may have disobeyed him and acted under her own free will, that she loves him, that she has a heart, that she, has, that she is old enough to make up her mind, to make up decisions. So he chooses to attack, to demonize and dehumanize Othello. Okay, so uh, uh, the, the, the issue here is that the very funny, again, bit from Shakespeare here. Babanchu is told that, it, again, remember, it's, it's, it's night now, that the, the council is in session. Remember, this is a domestic family so far, but in the background, there's war, there's politics. In bending. So there is a meeting at night, and then Barbancho, remember, Barbancho should be in the meeting, but nobody tells him. So he is unable to control his house and unable to, uh, to control his, his, his politics in a way. He doesn't know that a war is breaking out soon. He doesn't know that the, the, the council is in session. That shows how unimportant probably he is. So, how? The Duke and council in this time of night? Why? Why are they in meeting? Again, very interesting. Some people might not pay attention to this, but look at what Shakespeare is telling us, that this is a man, he's building a particular, constructing a particular character of this, of this man. So the man here, again, this is quotes from the, your book, Barbantu is doubly ineffectual in that, in, in that his role as a senator has been made meaningless by the council's meeting without him. And he is a, he's not important. We can make a meeting about war and make decisions without him being here. So he's not an essential uh, uh, person. And the same thing as a father, just as his role as a father has been made meaningless by his daughter's uh, actions. Othello has been with Desdemona during one evening that his services are really needed. And we'll talk about this in a bit and later on more. Othello is again unaware that there is war impending. Because simply speaking, instead of being busy with his job, he's busy running away with uh, a young daughter, a young uh, a lady. He has been focusing on personal issues rather than state issues and is taken off guard by the news that the council is looking for him. So everyone is going to go to the, uh, to the Cassio right now. Cassio, on the other hand, has been focusing on the impending war. Cassio knows, he's reporting this. He's asking Othello, come join the council. They're asking for you. And although he is Othello's lieutenant, he was not informed about the general's impending marriage. He doesn't know about the marriage. Interestingly, okay, the only character who knows everything, who is best informed, well informed, who knows everything, is Iago, <laughs> who seems to be best informed of the circumstances at hand, the political and the domestic. Note again his ability to be, to remain to pretend to be Othello's best friend. That's, that's uh, uh, Iago, and that's Othello here. And this is scene, uh, scene two, act one. Before we move to uh, scene uh, two, scene three, sorry, please say something or type something. Who's good in the play? You can judge later. We, I think it's too early to judge. I'm not sure what idea you have now about uh, Iago. He seems to be double-faced. Not sure whether you so far like, respect Othello, or you again waiting for more uh, uh, time to, to, to judge him. Anybody wants to comment, please? 
type or say unmute and say anything. Should I move to scene three? The most important, actually there are three scenes in act one. That last uh, scene three is the most important. Sarah says, I read about Iago's jealousy one critic wrote that Iago hates Othello because he heard a rumor. This is in scene, uh, in the next scene, uh, Sarah, yes. We'll talk about this also. Type. Okay. So we move to act one, scene three. And in, in this scene, we, we don't again come face to face with the, the issue here, the war, uh, why they invited uh, Othello and the war and the dispute over this Demona. We have two senators, look at what Shakespeare is doing. Fascinating. The two senators, look at this. Just one says, indeed they are disproportioned. My letter says 107 galleys. The Duke says, I think, and mine 140, so 107, 140, and the senator says, and mine 200. We don't have this in Hamlet, these issues, differences about numbers, but Shakespeare wants to build this play as a play about evidence, about proof, about checking, about science, about storytelling. This society, Venice, remember Barbancio says, this is Venice. This is a society of science, of knowledge, of figures, of evidence, of proof. They're going for war, but they're not going blindly for war. They're getting prepared for the right uh, situation, circumstances. So they're counting, there are three sources. One source says, but still again, even with mathematics and figures, there are differences. But look at how uh, the Senator, Senator Tusi says here, yet do they all confirm a Turkish fleet and bearing up to Cyprus. The definite news, the confirmed news, there's evidence that a Turkish fleet, a Muslim, Turkish, anything about Ottomans and Turkish and Turks means Muslim. A Turkish fleet is bearing up to Cyprus. There is war, the Francis. Now, this judgment, this proof, this confirmation about numbers is significant because Shakespeare wants to contrast two cultures, that of Venice and that of Othello's origins. One based on science and knowledge and figures and information and proof and evidence and checking and double checking, and one that is not. So he has science and numbers and figures and proof and several resources, not only one, not two, three sources until they can take something for a fact. Checking and double checking. When they arrive, look at this. Again, I keep this is uh, by the way, this play almost has no. Uh, 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 comedy in it. But it doesn't mean that you can't laugh once in a while here, every couple of pages or three pages. But not like we have in, in Hamlet, not long scenes. There's no comic grief. This is one of the most described to be. Uh, one critic was saying, look at this. Othello might not be Shakespeare's best play, but it's Shakespeare's best play. As a play, as you know, acts and scenes, might, may, maybe it's not his best. But the way he plays everything, the way he organizes everything, makes it one of the best. So the senator says, here comes Barbancio and the valiant more. more. So this, he, they describe, uh, Barbancio is just described as his name, although he's a senator. But the more, valiant more. And again, the Duke says, valiant more, we must straight employ you, hurry, we need you, there's a war, we need you to fight back, to defend us against the general enemy, the Ottoman. And then suddenly, the Duke sees Barbancio. The senator says, here comes Barbancio. Hey, I didn't see you. Sorry, I didn't see cash. And I asked Ms. Shaifer. <laughs> Again, Shakespeare wanting, wants uh, to, to show that this man is probably, I don't know, he's not that resp respected. He's not that famous, he's not that commanding. He doesn't have control about that. He doesn't have this charisma or character or personality. Not important, but I find it funny. Welcome, gentle senior. We lacked your counsel and your help tonight. Wallah tajnaak ya zalama. Wallah uznaak. Tab uznaak. You should have sent for him. 
right? He's, he's a member of the council. We needed your council. You should have invited him. Interesting what Shakespeare is doing here. Instead of just directly going to talk about the war, again, the Duke says, because he, the way he behaves and his facial expressions, what's, why? What's the matter? My daughter, oh, my daughter. And everybody, like several people say, what, dead? Is she dead? Yes, shall I could be good. What line is this? 60? Is it 60? No. When he, the way he behaves, the way he says laments, oh, my daughter, my daughter, oh, my daughter. Everybody, all here, there should be a colon. So everybody reacts, dead? What happened to her? Is she dead? I to me. To me, she's better dead than married to this man. She's abused. Again, how she's being objectified. She's abused, stolen from me, and corrupted by spells and medicines. Not medicines, medicines. Medicines are like spells and magic and, you know, adding materials so you can enchant somebody, make them lose their minds and influence them. But of Mount Banks for nature, so prostrously to err, being not deficient, blind, or lame of sense, sands without craft couldn't. Without, without magic, I couldn't have lost her. She couldn't be abused. She was enchanted. And again, look at this fascinating thing here. Whoever he, like, again, whatever happened, don't worry, we'll fix this, because he mentions here, and the bloody book of law, don't worry, this is Venice, we have law and order here, we'll sort everything else. And they don't judge Othello, they ask Othello, and this is again, this is the rule of law, hukm al-qanun, siyadit al-qanun. In your own part, can you say to this, what do you say, what do you think? Othello, what do you reply to this man? Is, is he telling the truth? Did you do this? So they don't judge. They have to check and double check. So again, this is Venice. The rule of law is, is everything. And again, I quoted long stuff. Now he talks more formally. He is now out-tonguing him. He's now using the language, the pedantic language he can, uh, he can do. And this is from page, uh, pages 46 and 47. And how remember when we Arabs, we have a meeting or a festival or something, when people start delivering speeches, it takes them ages to get to the point. He's doing this. Most potent, grave and reverend seniors. My very noble and approved good masters. That, you know, that I have taken away his, this old man's daughter. It is most true. True, I have married her. Yes, I've taken her. The very head and front of my offending hath this extent no more. Rude am I in speech. Don't, I, I, I might be rude in speech. I'm not as good as you are. But he is good, probably better than they are. And a little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. I'm not used to this. I'm a man of war. For since these arms of mine had seven years best till now, some nine moons wasted they have used the dearest action in the tinted field. I am only used to, bat to the battle, to war. I am not used to these things. I'm not good with words. But we'll see that he's good, he's better than anybody else. This is a very, very interesting defense mechanism. And a little of this great world can I speak more than that pertains to feats of broil and battle, and therefore little shall I grace my cause. In speaking for myself, Yet by your gracious, look at how he's praising them. He's trying to win them even more to his side. By your gracious patience, I will around unvarnished tale deliver. Circle the word tale a hundred times. I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story of my whole course of love. Why would you go for? For like 20 lines, because 
in, he's going to take a whole page in uh, 84 and 89 again. Uh, of my whole course of love, what drugs, what charms, what conjuration, and what mighty magic? For such proceeding am I charged with all I want his daughter. I'll tell you my story, my whole story. There is a war impending. Shut up, go fight. Stop it. But again, this is a problem. This is one of the problems. This is one of the flows in the society, in, in Othello himself. He doesn't distinguish between domestic and politics. Okay? So I'll tell you the story, the whole story. I'll tell you what magic, what charms, what drugs I used to win here. Okay? Barbancho again interferes. But I, I find this really, really, really very... Very racist. Look at this line, line uh, 87. To fall in love with what she feared to look on. He's speaking on behalf of this Demona. She's not here, by the way, so far. Begul, you know, how can she marry somebody she feared looking at? He's too ugly, too frightening, too weird, too alien. To fall in love with what she feared to look on. But look at the Duke again. To vouch, this is no proof. Malaysia, Barbancho, we like you, we respect you, but this is no proof. We need concrete evidence that she was enchanted. Again, so the rule of law, listening to all parties and summoning uh, of uh, this Debona, as we can see. And this is probably one of the most important speech for, for Othello. Very, very, very famous. Nobody studies or does research or anything on Othello without referring to this. I'll go through it very quickly and do some commentary and see what you have later on. Look at what he does. So, uh, remember, Bar Barbancho, the, the moment he heard that Othello eloped with his daughter, he hated him, he attacked him, he insulted him, he, was, he used racist remarks. He, he expressed his hate, his bigotry. Now, Othello tells us what had happened before. Her father loved me. Oh, you didn't know this. How did you love him, but now you don't want him to uh, get uh, married to your daughter? Oft, not only he loved him, oft invited me, he invited me to his home. Still questioned me the story of my life, asked me to tell the stories of my life. He loved my stories. From year to year, the battles, the sieges, the fortunes that I have passed, all the battles, the wars, the sieges, Hisarat, Ma'arik. I ran it through even from my boyish days. Look at this, how excellent he is with storytelling. Again, trying Shakespeare to give us two different images, the binaries here. The Venetian culture with science and evidence and proof and double checking. But Othello's origins, being an Arab, being a Muslim, being an African, he is more into science, sorry, more into storytelling, more into words, more into uh, uh, telling stories, okay? A man who doesn't understand to distinguish between war and politics, war, uh, uh, politics and domestic issues. The boyish days to the very moment that he bade me till it, till it, wherein I spake of most disastrous chances of moving accidents by flood and field. Look, like of moving flood and fear. Very poetic. What did he say exactly? Just rude am I in my speech? No, he's not rude. He's very poetic, beautiful. Of her breadth escapes. You know her breadth? In the eminent deadly breach of being taken by the insolent foe when I was ca captured, taken as a prisoner of war, and sold to slavery when I was a slave of my redemption. Hence how I managed to run away to get my freedom and the, the, uh, the portents in my my travels history, wherein of enters vast and deserts I, uh, idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills, whose heads touch heaven. Wajibal, 
it was my hand to speak, such was the process. And of the cannibals, you know the cannibals, people who eat flesh, that each other eat. Look at what kind of story he tells. We'll comment about uh, on this in, in a bit. Look, we have the white European society, and we have, on the other hand, we have that is, you know, scientific and superior in a way. And we have Othello, who is black and different and Arab and African, Muslim originally, uh, who is more into storytelling and rather than science and evidence. Now Othello wants to tell them, I am not that savage. I am closer to you than those people in Africa. So that's why he tells them about the cannibals. And if you think I am different, there are still people worse, far worse than I am. Look at how he wants to, he's trying to distance himself you know people who now go to, uh, to, from Gaza, the Arab world, and go to, uh, to seek asylum in America or Europe or Canada, they usually make, uh, yani some of them have legitimate rights. I don't want to demonize anybody. But some of them make up stories. They demonize us here so they can make a fair deal. So they can win their asylum very quickly. Say, oh, back home, they will kill me. They'll do this and they'll do that. But he's distancing himself from Africans, describing some of them as cannibals, and the anthropophagi, and men. Yeah, uh, in, in the book here it says, well, here in the book or somewhere else. Hmm. Uh, I think one of uh, the anthropophagi and the cannibals are both man-eaters. Uh, one, people who eat the, yeah, from the same tribe, and the anthropogai, I guess, I'll have to double check and get back to you. Uh, people who, who don't eat their own flesh, their, their tribe's flesh, they have to attack other people, other people uh, uh, and other tribes and eat their flesh. But it's the same, basically. And men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. There's a picture, if you have your book next to you, page 48. The picture of it. Imagine this person, how horrific, how absurd, how exotic it is, whose heads grow down beneath their shoulders, here on their chest. We don't have people like this. They, are, they don't exist. Is he lying to them? Is he just pretending to be? But look at how he makes his story wild and exotic and attractive, very suspenseful. This, to hear, would this demona seriously incline? See, see, this demona, like, whoa, what a kind of story this is. Please tell me more. Please uh, give me more. I want some more. But still, the house affairs would draw her hence, thence, whichever as she could with haste dispatch. She'd come to me and with a greedy ear devour up my discourse. Look at this metaphor here of Shakespeare, like, and words are like food. You don't just eat, you just devour. She's hungry for somebody to talk to, somebody to talk to her. Maybe she doesn't have this at home. Which I observing took once a pliant hour and found good means to draw her from, uh, from her a prayer of earnest heart that I would all my pilgrimage dilate whereof by parcels she had something heard, but not intentively. I did consent and often did beguile her of her tears. She would be crying, she would be moved, she would be affected. When I did speak of some distressful stroke, every time I spoke about me coming this close to death, she'd be like, oh, cry, you know, because she's a woman, she's tender, sentimental, that my youth suffered. My story, look at the repetition of the word, tell, tale, story, telling. My story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs. <sighs> <sighs> she keeps sighing and sighing like this. She swore in faith it was strange, it was passing strange. These stories are beyond their wildest imagination. And indeed, they are. It was pitiful, it was wondrous, pitiful. She wished she had not heard it. Yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. Look at again this man and woman thing, because it's terrifying. 
She wants more, but she doesn't want to hear because it's terrifying. She wished she had, she had been made a man so she could have a heart to listen to more of these stories. She thanked me. Look at this significant thing. I'll comment on this again here. She thanked me and bade me, if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story. She tells him, if I love somebody, please, Othello, teach him your stories so he can tell me the stories and entertain me. Again, she doesn't say, oh, Othello, I love you. This makes me love you, Othello. She says, if I fall in love, if I am in love, I want you to tell all your story to my beloved, to the person I love. So this person, again, she doesn't say, I love you, I want to marry you. If I had a friend that loved, that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story and that would woo her so he can woo her, win her heart with the stories. Upon this hint, I speak. I love the word speak, by the way. It's an old uh, uh, past symbol of speak, spoke, spoken. I love using it. Upon this, not many people who like, you know, to show off, they use speak. And it's very poetic, by the way. It's still in use in some poetic uh, context. Upon this hint, I spoke. So he took this as a hint. He is telling us that she's sending me, you know, hints. She's flirting with me. She tells me, I love your story. Tell it to somebody so I can love him. And then he takes this, oh, maybe she loves me. She loved me for the dangers I had passed. And I find this very interesting. And I loved her that she did pity them. I loved her sighs. I loved her tears. I loved that she was moved by my story, that she listened to my stories, that she was in love with my story. And indeed, this is one reason why we like people over other people, by the way. If you look at your friends, you, you like one more than the other because sometimes when you talk to them, to her, to him, many people are willing to listen, to be attentive, to listen to you, to share. But many people don't want to listen. They just want to talk. They don't want uh, you to talk. I love the very famous line. Uh, couplet here. She loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. This only is the witchcraft I have used. Here comes the lady, let her witness it. Here comes the used, witnessed, witness it, uh, uh, rhyming, not perfectly. So this is the woman, this is this demona. Let's listen to her, let's allow her to, to speak. This is the only witchcraft, the only magic eye I, I use. My argument here is that we, we, we'll see how this one says she loves Othello. But definitely here, there is an indication that Othello might have misunderstood the hint. Maybe she didn't want to love him. Maybe she didn't even think about loving him. She wanted somebody similar to him who's not black, who's originally white, European, Venetian, Christian. I don't know. I'll give you the chance to, to speak here in a bit. Uh, I, I'm not going to focus more, much on uh, this demon because next session we'll focus more on uh, this demon than anybody else. But look at this line here, line 252. And she says, man, again, that I did love the Moor to live with him, my downright violence and storm of fortunes, I made a trumpet to the world, my heart subdued even to the very quality of my Lord. I love him. I saw Othello's visage. Visage, you know visage? The Ozymandias, remember? Visage his face in his mind. In a way, again, indicating that blackness is a problem. And indeed, it is the issue. Uh, her father brought him to his home. Listen to his stories. Blacks, he, uh, she, he would spend hours with Desdemona. He told him, but his father, her father would invite him just as a storyteller. He would use he, the need Othello as an entertainer, an exotic, a like circus person, exotic person. A man of stories, a man to entertain them, a man to fight for them, to defend for, uh, them, to, to kill for them, but not to marry from them, not to be one of them, not to belong to fit 100%. And even this demona says here, I saw Othello's visage 
in his mind. I don't care about his blackness because yeah, I know it's, it's bad, it's negative, but this is very expected of, uh, of this time. So black is black, she loved him despite his blackness. Now Barbantio, again, remember how, I, how, how much I hated Polonius because of what he did to his daughter. The man, this man is doing, again, Herod, very like Polonius. Look to her more, if thou hast eyes to see. Look to her, not to uh, look after her. Beware, watch out, if thou hast eyes to see. She has deceived her father and made thee. Whoa. Again, a man talking about his daughter in this, that she's a deceitful, untrustworthy. Come on, Barbantio. She has deceived her father. And maybe this is going later on to be really, really, really horrible. Foreshadowing, probably Othello is going to remember this. Ah, her father. She, yes, indeed. She tricked her father. Tricking me is expected of her. Othello says, my life upon her faith. And then he says, honest Tiago. Oh, the worst, I said this last time, the worst dramatic irony in the whole play, in the whole of Shakespeare. You know, the oxymoron, you know, the oxymoron, the bitter sweet and the terrible beauty. You should be using this as an example. Honest Iago. But the audience knows that Iago doesn't like Othello, that he is not honest. And then Iago says, thou art sure of me, go make money. When he talks again later on to, to Rodrigo, don't worry about me. And he repeats, I hate the more declaration in front of Rodrigo and to the audience. I hate the more. I hate the more. And finally, the last bit in the whole scene is a soliloquy, not by Othello, not by Desdemona, but by Iago himself. Remember, we kind of felt that Iago is the antagonist, the bad guy. But unlike Hamlet, where Hamlet does almost all the soliloquies, we have Iago. So is he indeed the, the, the bad guy? Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. Again, Rodrigo, making use of him, abusing him. For I mine own gained knowledge should profane, if I would time expend with such a snipe, but for my sport and profit, I'm doing this for my own sport and profit. I hate the more, repeating it again. And by the way, hate is the worst word, possible word. It's a very heavy word on our hearts and minds and consciousness. I hate the more, declaring this to the audience, not hiding it. And it is to remember, First, he said, I hate him because he didn't give me the promotion. And now he's giving another excuse, all of a sudden. And it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets was done my office. He, my wife, cheated on me with him. He slept with my wife. And I, but look, again, he himself says, I know not if, t if it be true, yet I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for surety. I'm not sure. There's no evidence. I can't be certain, but I, I'll act upon this as if, as, if, uh, as if it is the truth and nothing but the truth. He holds me well, he loves me, he likes me, he trusts me. The better shall my purpose work on him. Cassius, a proper man, and Cassius, a good man. Let me see, I love this scene. I want you to go to watch some of the scenes, how some actors perfectly recite this. He, he isn't ready with a plan, he is thinking on the stage. Look at what he says. Let me see now to get his place and to plume up my well in double knavery. How? How? Let's see again. Let's, as if inviting the audience to be part of this. How? What should I do to destroy him, to bring him down, to avenge? And like the devil, in no time, in a split second, 
He has the perfect plan to destroy, the perfect scheme to destroy Othello. After some time to abuse Othello's ear, that he is too familiar with his wife, that, that Cassio is in love with this demona. He has a person and a smooth disposed to be suspected frame and to make, to make women false. The more is of a free and open nature. And in a way, he's too trusting and he's naive that thinks men honest, that but seem to be so. If you pretend to be honest, he'll trust you. He's naive. And I will as tenderly be led by the, and, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. He's like a donkey can be led by the nose. Again, using the animalistic imagery talking about Othello. And he ends with this, uh, 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 couplet again, I have it, yes! Oh. Imagine you being the audience. Imagine you, this is the incarnation of evil. This is Satan himself trying to destroy a love relationship between two married people. And then winning on the stage in front of you saying, yes, I have the plan. I have it. It is engendered hell and night must ride this monstrous birth to the world's light. Ooh, I don't know what exactly he says, it sounds a monstrous birth. He likens this idea to the birth of a monster that is going to be unleashed to the world. Oh my God, this is frightening. This is terrifying, especially again, you like sometimes you watch a movie a science fiction and you see the monster being born hatching out of an egg in front of your eyes and like what's going to happen this is similar to that in several ways i'm not going to take much just five minutes i'll, I'll give you a, ch a chance to, to talk this is very significant what i'm going to say now okay i wanted to say it early in the class but i I'm delaying this to the end of the class. If you want to watch this class again, start from here. Remember again, we used our friends, our, uh, 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 our friends, uh, uh, Coleridge's statement on uh, suspension of disbelief to make many points in Hamlet. And remember we said these uh, critics are really interesting. We use them, we quote them, but you don't have to take them for granted. Now, Coleridge describes uh, Iago's evil as motiveless malignity, and it's become very famous, this expression. Especially motiveless malignity, yani hate that has no motive. There is no reason, we don't understand why Iago well, uh, is doing this. No, we know, we understand, because he is a racist, white supremacist, and a bigot. It's an answer, So, sorry, uh, Coleridge, we're not going to take you here. We're not going to agree with you. There is a motive. The motive is that this man, he, he, he pretends, he claims that he lost the promotion and that Othello slept with his wife. But in reality, he's racist. Every time he talks about Othello, he uses these racist remarks about him. So he says he hates Othello for not giving him the promotion. And now he says he hates him because he slept his wife. He has no evidence. And then, why did he do, listen, later on he's going to give another reason, by the way, we'll see. The last speech, the motive, hunting of motiveless malignity. How awful in its finish. I want you to think of this more and, and more. I love this again, I want to emphasize the how, how, let's see. I wish I'll see, let's see. One critic said, not sure if I said this last time, that Iago is the scariest of all Shakespeare's characters. Because he wants us to be complicit in the evil. He wants us to be partners in the evil. Let us see. And because he makes us, oh my God, is any of my friends an Iago? Is there an Iago in my life? Somebody I trust, I reveal all my secrets to, and he is the worst of the worst. So he seems to be thinking in front of us, with us, for us. And it seems terrifying, especially how fast and spontaneously evil ideas flow into his head, like Satan himself. 
in mere seconds, he comes up with a perfect scheme to destroy two lovers. Remember, it is Iago, not Othello, who does the first soliloquy. Okay? Anybody? I'll give you, uh, oh, sorry, we took uh, too much time. Uh, if you want, if somebody wants to comment, I'll read it a couple of slides and then we stop. She loves his soul. Anybody? Type. Look at this. Uh, uh, this uh, summarizes, uh, concludes everything. I'll, I'll go through this again and again, because to me, this is the core issues in, in Othello. In scenes two and three, Othello has always been portrayed by white men. Uh, he has been framed to us. He, he was presented to us by white men as an outsider. Many critics prefer to gloss, this is significant, to gloss the racial politics of the play. We're like, no, 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 this, is, this has nothing to do with the racism. Othello's color has nothing to do with this. The, the, they can't be more wrong, those people. They prefer to focus on the universal themes of male jealousy, doomed uh, love, uh, devoted uh, female victims, victims who are uh, uh, males, uh, women who are, uh, who are victims to female, to bad patriarchy and male violence. Glossing racial politics deprives the play of its really psychological depth and significance and universality. In this course, we have to rethink the entire history of the play and its reception and its production. We're going to focus on the play basically in terms of racial politics and post-colonialism. Now Othello's identity in scene uh, one, act one, uh, Othello is presented as an outsider. We hear of him before we see him, but we can paint a particular picture, negative picture of him because of the way he was framed to us by three characters. Both, we, we think about his physical appearance and also his mentality, how he acts and how he behaves due to the way he was performed to us. Othello lives in a white society. This is significant. He does everything to assimilate. He wants you know, assimilate, integrate to be part of the society. He lives among them. He abandons his, Islam, his religion, Islam, or whatever he believed in before. He converts to Christianity. He marries one of them. He fights for them. He kills for them. He does almost every possible thing to be part of them, to assimilate, to integrate. He barely maintains at, at, at any trace of identity. The only thing he, he keeps from his original identity is his skin color and storytelling, his fondness for storytelling. But is this enough for white people? Is it enough to do this? Will you be accepted? Assimilation, is this assimilation? By melting into the European culture, Othello clearly isolates himself from his origins. The way he deliberately appropriates his cultures and his stories to entertain white people, to make white people like him, to distance himself from his cultural religion, cultural and religious issues background by converting to Christianity, by appealing to white Europeans, by focusing on the things they like. They like his ex 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 exoticism, tales, heroism, fighting, but they don't like his original religion or culture of being African, being black, his color. Othello works hard to distance himself from other monstrous non-Europeans. He's telling them, I am not like the, the anthropopoeg guy, the, the cannibalists, men whose heads grow below their shoulders. References to Othello as thick lips, black crime, etc. mark him as inferior and alien. But he is still distinguished from men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders as, as he says himself. Authorial intention, remember that question, I mentioned this and again, I repeat it again. Please don't tell me uh, with a, don't focus much on whether Shakespeare meant it or not. We don't care. We care about the text the issue. So does Othello, many people will accuse Shakespeare of being a racist, but does Othello warn against interracial marriage? 
a marriage between a white woman and a black man? Or does it indict, attack, criticize the society which does not allow it? Which does not allow it? And I want you to think of this, discuss the issue of the construction of the other in Othello. How is Othello's other, how is he othered? How is he constructed in, in this play? And finally, this scene, scene three especially, uh, shifts from the personal to the political, from the domestic, the life, the marriage, to war, to fighting. And then the, th the scene mixes the personal and the political. And this is actually one problem here. The inability of, of Othello to distinguish between these things. He acts as a soldier at home and acts as a, a husband in the war. Shakespeare, this is from your book, juxtaposes, you know, juxtaposes, mixes the struggles of the domestic sphere with the struggles of the political sphere. Two seemingly distant worlds that upon closer examination have much in common. Again, this demona is being objectified and is treated as property, something to be stolen, something to be detracted as unintellectual. And finally, from the book again, Othello's sending for, for this demona, it was he who suggested first to bring her, to fetch her, to listen to her, to allow her to talk. Is that in doing so, we realize Othello is the only one who thinks to ask this demona herself what happened. Babantius, and the council's willingness to overlook this demona in this whole affair speaks to their inability to see women on par with men, as equal to men. They don't see this. They don't. This is a society, despite its everything, or all the good things, a society that doesn't see women as equal to men, as on par with men. Reham says, uh, again, I'll stop in two minutes unless you have to say something. I think Coleridge means that Iago is just like the people who love bullying and who just want to ruin others' life because they think they live to hate others. It's what makes him feel powerful. But again, the, the issue that you have no motive is what we disagree with uh, uh, Coleridge on. There is motive here. And again, there are differences. What the motive is the promotion, his wife, this demona, or is it racism and bigotry, white supremacy? I'm sorry, I took, uh, I didn't expect this to go uh, this long. Uh, uh, I'll give one minute if you want to comment. I'll post the video in an hour. And if you have things to say, we can start next time class with the last uh, couple of. Uh, slides here and then we, we can discuss imp these important issues. I'll conclude with what Khalid just typed. I just want to link the form to the content regarding the last two lines in the soliloquy. I think the perfect rhyme is a kind of foreshadowing that the plan is going to work. Possible, thank you Khalid, possible, possible. The, perfect, the, 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 the fact that the... Uh, uh, The fact that this is a perfect, almost a perfect uh, a couplet with a perfect rhyme scheme could foreshadow his the perfection of the plan. That is possible. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, Sarah wants to why did he choose to destroy Othello's marriage, the relationship between he and his beloved wife, rather than his Othello's job? Again, that's a very, that's a very good question. Why doesn't he, but remember, if he destroys him, his, his relationship with his demona, he's going to destroy everything. Okay? If he destroys Othello's job as a fighter, as a commander, as a warrior, maybe he's not going to impact his personal life. So the plan is to destroy his life, and by destroying his life, to destroy his job. But again, we keep thinking about this. That's a very good question. Sarah, thank you very much. طيب يا جماعة أعطيكم العافية أشكركم I'm sorry for keeping you this late and see you on Wednesday إن شاء الله thank you very much يلا السلام عليكم